Hi everyone, I'm Jacob Lackner, and it's Thursday, so that means it's time for another video. As usual, I ran a poll that allowed the viewers to decide on today's subject, and most people wanted to see a video on the sadistic science experiments of Frederick II, so that's what we're doing today. If the name seems familiar to you, it's because he was included in my list of 10 most important medieval scientists. In that video, I talked mostly about the positives of Frederick II's analytical mind and experimentation, but this time around we're going to look at the darker side of his thirst for knowledge, which involved what can only be described as sadistic experiments on human subjects. To cover this subject, I'm going to do three things. First, I'll give you some context about who Frederick II was. Second, I'll discuss a monk named Salem Bene, who was our main primary source for Frederick II's experiments. And then, of course, we're going to talk about the experiments themselves. So let's start with the brief biography of Frederick II. The guy had a pretty interesting life that certainly helped shape him into the kind of person he was. He was born in 1194 to Holy Roman Emperor Henry VI and his wife, Constance. His mother was a Norman whose family were the kings of Sicily. At the time, the kingdom of Sicily was not just the island we call Sicily today, it also included much of southern Italy. On his father's side, he was the heir to the Hohenstaufen line of Holy Roman Emperors, and his family had a long history of conflict with the papacy, since the Hohenstaufens felt they should have more control over Italy than they did, and the Pope opposed their territorial expansion into the region. In fact, the Pope greatly feared the union of Constance and Henry, because their son would potentially be heir to both the Holy Roman Empire and the Kingdom of Sicily, and this would effectively allow their child to attack the papacy on two separate fronts. Frederick's father died in 1196, and as a two-year-old, he received his first of many titles, King of Germany. His mother died in 1198, and he received his second title, King of Sicily. At this point, Pope Innocent III was on the Papal See, and he saw an opportunity to try to quell the potential conflict between the papacy and the young Frederick. Innocent stepped forward to be his guardian. At this point, the Holy Roman Empire was embroiled in an internal conflict, and Frederick's other relatives kind of wanted him out of the way so they could try to take his titles, especially that of Holy Roman Emperor, which he would eventually receive. And so nobody in the Holy Roman Empire really objected to the idea that he had to go and live with the Pope. Frederick was taken to Rome, where he received an excellent education, and one of his teachers would later be Pope Honorius III. So he had a close relationship with the papacy, to say the least, at least for a few years. And the hope, from the papal point of view, was that they could groom Frederick to be their ally and not their enemy. This would only last a few years, though, as in 1201 his Sicilian family members were upset by the situation and managed to force the papacy to relinquish their guardianship of Frederick. So Frederick was largely raised in Sicily, where he came into close contact with diverse peoples, including Muslims and Africans. From a young age, he was very interested in different cultures and religions, and when you couple that with the fact that he knew the papacy was his enemy, and you end up with a man who really doubted Christianity, something that would be true for pretty much the rest of his life, making the conflict with the papacy both political and religious during his reign, since he was so cynical about the Christian faith. He received an excellent education wherever he was as a child, and he put this to good use. He spoke seven languages and was a major patron of the arts and the sciences. He wrote a book on how to hunt using birds of prey, and, as we'll see, he performed many science experiments. And again, I talked about the more positive ones in the Top 10 Scientists video. Frederick was highly ambitious and saw himself as the heir to the Roman Empire of late antiquity, and he wanted to conquer all of Europe. He was a capable military leader who experienced great successes for much of his life. Ultimately, he would have to get his northern territories back because his other family members had usurped them from him. He started from Sicily and slowly moved north, conquering parts of Italy and then Germany. He would also be the leader of the successful Sixth Crusade, which managed to take back the city of Jerusalem. Funnily enough, he'd actually been excommunicated before the Crusade, and he put the papacy in a pretty awkward spot since he had achieved the ultimate goal of capturing Jerusalem during a time when the church had shunned him, and a bunch of other Crusades that were more openly sponsored by the papacy had failed. Being excommunicated didn't really matter to Frederick, though. He was excommunicated several times during his life, and he pretty much ignored it every time. Frederick died in 1250. And when he died, he had the following titles. He was the Holy Roman Emperor, the King of Germany, the King of Italy, the King of Sicily, and the King of Jerusalem. Obviously, he was pretty successful, as evidenced by all those titles. However, everything he did was marred by his constant conflict with the papacy, whose power he sought to usurp in Italian conquests. In the long run, the papacy managed to win out in their long-standing conflict, and ultimately he had to give up a lot of power in Germany, and instead focus the most on his Italian and Sicilian holdings during the last decade or so of his life. It should be noted that Frederick had a reputation for being cold-hearted and pragmatic, and some of the descriptions of him make him sound like what we might call a sociopath today. 
This will become clear when we look at his scientific exploits. So that's a brief rundown of Frederick II's life. Now let's take a quick look at a monk named Salem Bene, who was our primary source for Frederick's experiments. Salem Bene was an Italian monk of the Franciscan order, who was most well known for composing a chronicle that covers most of 13th century Italy. The chronicle features many details about Frederick II, and what interests us the most for this video is the science experiments he performed on humans. As you can probably guess, as a monk, Salem Bene sided with the papacy in the conflict between the emperor and the papal see. As a result, we do have to keep in mind when reading Salem Bene's description of Frederick's experiments that he is writing from a very anti-Frederick point of view. So take some of what I'm going to talk about in the remainder of this video with a grain of salt. That said, the types of science experiments he describes do fit with what we know of Frederick from other sources, so they don't seem out of character. We know that he had an analytical mind that sought to investigate and understand everything, and we also know that he was cold and calculating and didn't really see giving up human lives for his goals as a big deal. If we take those two things together, it does make sense that he would perform experiments on people, but again, a good idea to be a little skeptical about Salem Bene's descriptions. All right, let's move now to the science experiments that Salem Bene describes. Let's start with his linguistic experiments. Frederick II was absolutely fascinated by languages. He loved to learn them, but it bothered him that there was so much he didn't know about language. Most notably, he wanted to know what the pure language was. He had an idea that all the languages people speak are corrupted forms of a pure language, an original language, and he wanted to know what language people would speak with no outside influence at all. In the Top 10 Scientists video, I described an experiment where he left a woman who was deaf and couldn't speak on an island to raise a baby, and he wanted to come back three years later. However, when he did, they were both gone. Their actual fate is unknown, but it is likely that they died given the harsh situation. Salem Bene relates another experiment Frederick did in his quest to learn about language. He wrote the following about this experiment. He made linguistic experiments on the bodies of hapless infants, bidding foster mothers and nurses to suckle and wash the children, but they were in no way to communicate with them. He did this so that he could learn whether they would speak Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Arabic, or perhaps the tongue of their parents of whom they had been born, but he labored in vain, for the children could not live without speech, the clapping of hands, gestures, smiles, and blandishments. So, to sum up, this experiment was all about trying to discover something about language. Frederick seems to have believed that the children would speak some language, even if they never heard any language at all. In short, he wanted to know what might have been that first pure language. He also seems to have thought that perhaps children just naturally would speak the language of their parents, sort of a genetic component, not that he would call it that. This experiment is even more sadistic than just not speaking to children, though. According to Salem Bene, Frederick didn't want the people who took care of them to give them any kind of communication, not even gestures or smiles. Basically, these babies were deprived of any sort of real human contact, and ultimately, they died. Let's move now to another of Salem Bene's descriptions of a Frederick II experiment. He writes, He enclosed a living man in a cask until he died because he wanted to show that the soul perished completely. For he was an Epicurean, wherefore, partly of himself and partly through wise men, he sought out all that he could find in Holy Scripture, which might make for the proof that there was no life after death. In this case, Frederick forcibly suffocated a man because he wanted to see if he could observe the man's soul leaving his body. In this particular description, Salem Bene describes the impetus for a lot of these experiments. He calls Frederick an Epicurean. Epicureans are a philosophical school that believes this life that we live on Earth is the only one, so you may as well enjoy it now. So in short, Frederick was a skeptic about any sort of idea of the afterlife, as was common in Christianity, and he sought to see whether the things in the Bible were true or not, and Salem Bene seems to imply this was the impetus for a lot of his experiments. Salem Bene doesn't relate the result of this experiment to us, but it's a pretty sure thing that the man died and Frederick didn't see his soul leaving his body. Let's move now to the last experiment we're going to look at in this video. Once again, described by Salem Bene, who wrote, He fed two men most excellently at dinner, one of whom he immediately ordered to sleep and the other to hunt. That same evening, he ordered them to be disemboweled in his presence, wishing to know which had digested their food better. Frederick and his physicians concluded that food was digested better by the man who went to sleep. So with this experiment, Frederick is interested in learning what the best way to digest food is. A useful thing to know, to be sure, but not something that other people would try to discover in such a terrible way. When I read this particular description, I get the impression that the two men had no idea what their fate would be. They probably thought it was pretty awesome that they got an excellent meal from the emperor, only to find out they were going to be killed later, just so Frederick could come to some conclusion about the best way to digest food. 
So in short, Frederick II had a highly inquisitive mind and he was a skeptic, and these are key aspects of scientific thinking. But he was willing to sacrifice human lives in order to satiate his powerful thirst for knowledge. That does it for this video. Don't forget to vote on the poll on the community tab to help choose next week's topic. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you see future videos, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you're interested in catching up on some of my other videos, you should see some of them on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.